Hello and welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Smolsky, joined as always by Scott Pianowski as we continue our fantasy baseball preview uh, episodes. We're going to the shortstop position today. Um, Scott and I covered second base and catcher. Uh, DJ and I covered first base a while back, um, so make sure you go and check out those episodes. Um, but we're getting into the the more exciting, well, I guess they're all exciting, but you know, the shortstop's a little bit more of a glamour position here. Um, so Scott, have you have you been enjoying your your digging in process? Your uh, you know, getting through the rankings and all that kind of stuff. Are you you gearing up? You're ready to go? Oh, I'm ready to go. And uh, not only that, but um the night before we were taping this podcast, I had my first real draft of the season. I was in the labor mixed league draft. So nothing gets your juices flowing, like the actual application of all the work you put mm-hmm. in. That's why you lift all them weights, as Bill Parcells <laughs> would say. So uh, eager to get to shortstop today, which is a fun position, man. It's, you know, you play Little League, the best players at shortstop. You, you look at, like, you know, Keith Law prospect rankings. Everybody starts at shortstop. And then it's a matter of do you stay at the position I, I played fantasy baseball long enough. Where I remember when there weren't good shortstops and then yeah. Derek Jeter came along and Alex Rodriguez came along and Nomar Garcia Parr went along. And, and now I think the position is actually somewhat deep. It's helped in Yahoo. We have the most liberal position eligibility in, in the, uh, in the fantasy industry. I, I don't think we're talking about Mookie Betts today, but he is a shortstop eligible player. I just want to note that off, off the top, but mm-hmm. um, shortstop's a fun position. I remember when it was a thin position and, and I realize you, you, this stuff you have to give up and maybe it doesn't necessarily match up with some of the other positions. The outfield is just loaded with, with four and five category players, but I, I like where the position's at. I feel like you can do well at any price point at shorts up this year. And so that makes me feel good. Yeah, this is, um, as people will see when we get to our rankings, we were a little more in lockstep in some of the other positions. There's a little bit more differentiation here, which is interesting and exciting because it allows you to kind of see different ways you you can attack the position. Um, Just quickly before we get into shortstop, since you did just have your first big draft last night, um, any notable takeaways, um, just generally speaking, in terms of fantasy baseball draft prep? In this particular league, the... The room was very closer driven. Uh, Paul Spore took closers at the end of the third round and the front of the fourth round. And Jenny Butler, who was the pick away from Paul, also took two closers. So that's four closers in a row. Starting pitching was pushed up. So what I ended up doing is I ended up getting as much offense and as many at bats as I can, which I think is a great mixed league strategy. It's just going to be a challenge for me to get the right starting pitching. Look, starting pitching is always going to be the hardest, most challenging thing in fantasy. We'll put the most work into it in the off season and then the season will happen and it will look like it was all for naught because half of those guys will feel like they're hurt. But I focus on getting offense because I think it's more projectable year over year and I'm going to have to figure out pitching. I don't have the greatest bullpen. I have a starting staff that feels like it's a man or two light, but that, that, that's a build that I'm comfortable with. I Honestly, that's my strategy anyway, going into drafts. Um, and that may be because I spend so much time focusing on pitching that I'm comfortable you know, maybe grabbing one guy early and, and then waiting. But I love um, I love getting hitters early. Um, I have found myself liking some of these shortstops in the later tier. So we'll we'll start getting into um, some of these shortstops. Uh, first, just let's talk about the overall state of the position. Um, you mentioned that, you know, there are lots of kind of intriguing ways that you could build. Uh, as a, a, Based on last year's results, uh, it actually had the lowest batting average per position of non- catcher eligible or non-catcher positions the lowest um the lowest amount of hitters that hit over 240 which is a little bit of an arbitrary cutoff but to me i believe that's like a usable fantasy average or an average that doesn't hurt you once you start getting into like the 220s and 230s it can be a little bit of a detriment um shortstop had the fewest 20 homer hitters um of the non-catcher positions and only three more shortstops stole over 15 bases uh, from 2022. So obviously we know that stolen bases were up drastically across the board. Um, Only three more shortstops got in on the fun in a way they hadn't been before. And that's an important uh, distinction to make is that there are a lot of shortstops who were stealing bases beforehand. And then we saw them steal bases. um, And some of them like, you know, Bobby Witt, who we'll talk about like even more this year, but we didn't necessarily get more depth Um, at the position in terms of stolen bases. The guys who stole tended to keep stealing and steal more, and the guys who didn't 
steal bases beforehand got like a minor bump but didn't become like real stolen base assets they became guys who may chip in a few more than you're used to um but they weren't guys who like you went out and really targeted for steals um i guess i'm curious your general thoughts on the depth of the position which then also leads me to my next question about like is shortstop where you're looking to get two guys from for like your shortstop and your middle infield, or does that not really matter to you? You don't care if that's a shortstop or a second baseman. Yeah, I think shortstop's a little bit deeper than the second base, but it's not to the point that I would mandate, oh no, don't get caught with two second basemen. For the most part, a lot of times what I'm doing with that middle infielder is I'm trying to get somebody who plays multiple positions so I can go positionless when I get injuries and just put in the best offensive player and then make the puzzle pieces fit. So, uh, it, it, this, again, I think shortstop's a little bit deeper. I don't think it's a major difference. Maybe some of the stats you talked about with averaging and, and this stat, this category, um, I'm sorry, this position being a little bit category thin. I think what that speaks to is maybe the bottom, like five or six shortstops are really bad mm-hmm. in baseball right now. But I think this position, I, I feel really good about the 20 I have coming at you. And, I, and there are a couple of guys who are interesting who I left off. So I don't think it's bad if you have to go 18, 20, 25 deep, something, so maybe 22, 23 deep, something like that. The problem is if you're in like an AL only or an NL only league and you may have to grab a guy because you get 500 bats and it's going to be a negative offensive player, that's going to worry me. But I think there's enough to support your common 12 team mixed league. I don't think you'll have any problem filling this position with somebody you feel good about. Yeah. And I think you'll, you'll be able to, it's not obviously a real, a power, driven position and hasn't really been i mean you know you mentioned the guys like a rod and nomar garcia para and stuff in the past that kind of transformed the position you still have your your guys that will hit for pop uh as a shortstop but generally speaking it's a category where you know if you need to find average if you need to find um speed if you need to find runs it's a little bit easier to do that um especially after the early rounds um that's where your guys who hit meaningful home runs at shortstop are going early in you know your bobby witts and your Corey seegers um and you know fernando tatis jr and and stuff like that um so there were a few there weren't actually even a lot of like notable team changes with shortstops over the offseason um so i'll skip the first one that you see on our rundown and we'll come back to that because it wasn't a change we had mentioned von grissom being traded to the red sox um in the offseason he is uh, will be playing second base for the Red Sox, but he is only shortstop eligible in leagues right now. Um, his move to the Red Sox, you talked a little bit before, but is there anything else you want to add? I assume you you like this move for him, obviously, because it locks him into a starting gig. For sure. Um, probably in the bottom third of the lineup to start the season, but there's no guarantee he'll stay there. Uh, they're really lefty heavy at the top. I'd like to see another right-handed hitter get in there. The type of move the Red Sox should be making has been a very disappointing offseason for Boston a team that should be a big market team that's pretending like they're a middle America, small market team. I really don't understand it, but I think it's a good buy low for them. And Grissom is one of those guys. You might draft him as just a bench player. He might even be just under your watch list to begin the season. But I think he'll be, I think his roster tag will probably go up a lot in the first month when people remember that this guy can actually play. He just had one bad season, but he's too young to discount. And I think he'll be a double digit home or double digit speed guy. When I see that kind of category juice, I think it's mixed league relevant. Yeah, and he's not even going to be somebody we discussed today in our rankings. Mm -hmm. So that that does tell you a little bit about the depth of the position. Um, We just very recently saw Ahmed Rosario um, sign with the Rays. He had been somebody who was uh, potentially a starting shortstop or second baseman, depending on on where he landed. Um, He's been a pretty bad defensive shortstop the last couple of years. Uh, seems like he might be setting up to be a platoon bat with Brandon Lau at second base. W- what are your feelings on um, Rosario landing with Tampa? Yeah, Tampa Bay is just one of those teams. They want a different lineup every day. And if Rosario is in the platoon, he'd be on the short side of it, which would mean you're hoping maybe he gets to 300, 350 at bats. He's going to need an injury to draw into relevance. Now, Tampa Bay's been right so often with these types of moves that I'm at least interested that Rosario landed here, but right mm-hmm. now he doesn't have a path to enough playing time where he should be somebody you're drafting in a typical mixed league. Yeah, so I, I'm a little more optimistic, but I'm still giving him like 400 to 450 because I know he can also play the outfield, and so there's the idea that Tampa could move him around beyond mm-hmm. just second. But just like you, I mean, if you give him somewhere between 400 and 450 at-bats, um, that 
doesn't really become you know 12 team mixed league relevant however if he's somebody who becomes second base shortstop outfield you know eligible in your deeper formats on a in a good lineup um you know even as a part-time player that's somebody that that's intriguing i think if you're in like a daily moves league he becomes more interesting again a deeper daily moves league but because you could move him in and out of the lineup we know he's going to start against lefties we know he's good against lefties um, you can move him in when he gets those spot starts against righties. So that's interesting to me. Um, his name had been linked with Tim Anderson's name because the two of them were kind of the last remaining middle infielders. Um, we heard today that Tim Anderson, um, the report is that he was offered a contract by the Marlins. Um, there's been no movement yet on whether he accepts that contract. The two have been linked together, obviously, because the Marlins currently are starting John Birdie at short. Um if Tim Anderson goes to the Marlins, does that interest you? Or if Tim Anderson goes anywhere, does he interest you? He was a really, really consistent hitter prior to last year when it seemed like everything collapsed. Man, did everything collapse? And I, I took no joy in that. I mean, this guy's won a batting title, hit over 300 four years in a row. And Tim Anderson was the poster child of, oh, regression's going to hit. He's, he's not really a 300 hitter. He swings at everything. Look at the walk rate. And he beat that four years in a row. One of my favorite players, but then last year, everything collapsed a year where just about everything collapsed for Chicago. And now he's age 31 season doesn't have a job. I mean, he was just a, a secondary base dealer for the last few years. He hasn't seen 20 stolen bases since 2018 in his best years. He'll hit you double digit home runs, but he's never hit more than 20. He only hit one last year in Chicago, you know, played him for five months of the season. I'm just afraid that, it's not uncommon for players to have a career arc like Tim Anderson, where they're a good player, maybe even a quasi star in their twenties. And then they hit a wall in their thirties. I'm just afraid that Tim Anderson may be done as a bonafide major leaguer. Now he'd make a lot of sense for Miami because John birdie, we, you talked about Rosario bouncing around the diamond, maybe being a super utility player. That's kind of what John birdie is. Shouldn't really be an everyday regular Miami could be a playoff contender as they have been the last few seasons that a lot of players in the team actually want to draft. So I, I think kicking the tires on Anderson on a cheaper deal makes a lot of sense, but I'm not going to draft him with any optimism. He'll have to play his way onto my roster. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, I'm a little more optimistic that the, the stolen, sorry, the stolen base, the batting average won't be as empty as it was last year. I mean, this is a guy who was always at least um, I mean, really, he was a 300 hitter. So, I think giving him 270, 280 feels better to me than giving him, you know, the 245 that he hit last year. As you mentioned, not a huge stolen base guy, but he's hit at least 13 um, in his last three full seasons. So, you know, maybe he's a 275, 280 hitter with 15 stolen bases. And again, if you're in a deeper format that is usable, it's not something you're like incredibly excited about, um, but it is usable. Uh, the last player who didn't change teams but is maybe entering um our our discussion for shortstops is jackson holiday who's the top prospect for the orioles and uh they have basically made it clear that he will be given every opportunity to leave camp with the orioles presumably as their starting shortstop um he didn't appear in either of our rankings um, our top 20. So I'm just curious where you're at on him. A, the idea that he may actually be the starting shortstop on a really good team. And B, just your general, um, I guess, willingness to roster somebody who is being so aggressively promoted that we don't really know how he's going to adjust to the MLB game. I realize this is no fun to say this, but the type of player that Halliday is, 20 years old, hot prospect, if he does make the Orioles out of camp, he'll probably be bagging the bottom of the order. I'm just unlikely to be in the shuffle to get him right away. It's fully expecting he'll be a great player. I mean, what a fun team this is with Gunnar Henderson. And we talked about Adley Rutschman being a possible MVP candidate. These guys, it's so much young talent on this team. And it was exciting to see them get a pitcher in Corbin Burns because we know how badly they need pitching, especially mm -hmm. with Bradish hurt right now. But I just get a figure with Holiday. They're not going to want to put pressure on him. If he has any, if he makes the club and has any kind of a speed bump, they're just okay. We'll go back to the minors, go beat up on minor league pitching for a while. He's twenty years old. I mean, he just turned twenty at the end of last season. I mean, he's Matt Holiday's kid, which makes you feel a little bit old if you're of a certain age. Because I remember Matt Holiday's entire career. But it's just we 
we're built as humans to want to be optimistic. I think Jackson Holiday is going to be a superstar. I think every scout who's promoted him is right. I just don't want to expect miracles right away. So this is the type of player I generally don't draft. And when these players are great right away, which happens sometimes, it's there's a lot of FOMO going on. But um, I'm just not the type of player I want to put a lot of expectations on right away. And I think the Orioles have the benefit. I think they're doing the right thing. They're giving him a chance to make the team. They're not promising him anything. I just feel like if it's a coin flip, they'll probably think, well, he's 20 years old. Why start the clock right now? Mm -hmm. we, we can wait on this. So I'm going to be low man on holiday. And I admit I say that knowing it's no fun and knowing there's some trepidation because sometimes these guys do hit the ground running. I just think it's the wrong way to bet. I agree with you. I mean, I think every time you miss on, you know, uh, Julio Rodriguez type of season, you think, oh, I should have, you know, I really should have been in on it. I think there are just as many instances where you get like a Jordan Walker situation who wound up having a good year last year, but struggled at the beginning, was sent down, was called back up at the end. And there is there is an easy narrative you can tell yourself where that's a path for Jackson Holiday is he gets a shot. The Orioles have tons of infield depth. If he struggles a little bit out of the gate, maybe they send him to AAA to give him a little bit more time. Then they call him back up and. Um, so it, it does add some risk to that profile where I'm happy to draft Jackson holiday, but I have him, you know, down in my rankings around guys. I have question marks about anyway, and not guys who I feel secure in their playing time. I'm so glad you mentioned Jordan Walker, because that's how I love to play this one in doubt is by in the post type season, Jordan Walker mm -hmm. will not be, we're not going to have a 20 minute discussion on Jordan Walker in the third base or outfield preview. I, I forget where he slots right now like we would have maybe last year. And that's good. That means the ADP will come down. The expectations will be realistic. It speaks really highly to Jordan Walker that he was did not look over a match as a rookie at a really young age. But last year, near the end of the uh, draft season, late March, I mean, he was going like seventh, eighth, ninth rounds of drafts. Mm -hmm. that, you, you're just never going to make a profit on that more often than not. I, I think it's the wrong way to play. And again, it, means, it meant you had to sit out Jordan Walker, which – didn't seem like a, a fun thing in early April, but when you look at the balance of the season, it was the right move. And I think that's probably the right move with Jackson holiday too. Yeah. That's the, uh, the FOMO drafting where like, mm -hmm. you're like, Oh, everybody's drafting this guy. I really want to. Um, there was a guy, another guy with Jordan Walker who was getting drafted like that last year, but he's a name that we will actually get to um, in our rankings today. So we will, we'll dive into those rankings, but before we do that, spring training is here. So for those looking to get ahead, on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player previews to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. That's NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. Um, so we're going to start from the bottom of our rankings. Um, you know, Scott and I, will, we've done this on the other podcast as well. We'll go 20 to 13, um, and then we'll do our top 12 because, again, if you're in at least a 12-team league, those are going to be the 12 guys that we believe at least are starting shortstops. Um, and some of these guys are certainly usable as a starting shortstop as well. Um, so, Scott, your 20 to 13 are who? Number 20 is Luis Renjifo. I know it's kind of a sad time for Anaheim. They lost Otani. Anthony Rendon, does he want to be playing baseball? Mike Trout, would he want to trade him? Can he play 140 games anymore? I don't know. But Renjifo qualifies four positions in Yahoo, and he'll bat near the top of the lineup. So that certainly gives him some fantasy value. You know, Jeremy Pena, I don't really understand what to do with him. My 19 shortstop, he's got great sprint speed, but the stolen bases haven't been there. He took a step back in his second season. So he's somebody I think has an interesting set of outcomes this year. I would like to see him take a step forward with the stolen bases. Cause again, the, the guy runs like the wind 95% sprint speed, but it hasn't translated yet. Willie Adamas swings hard in case he hits it last year. Babbitt wasn't great. We know he's going to be a batting average drain, but Milwaukee is a really good park for home runs and Adamas will probably about clean up for them. So I can't go too low on him, even though he's somewhat of a limited player, Ezekiel Tovar, my 17 shortstop, a lot of swing and miss in his game, but Colorado will mitigate some of that. Unfortunately, with Coors Field, as great as it is, that means these guys go on the road, and a lot of times their batting timing is all screwed up, so that takes a little bit of the Colorado fun away. Anthony Volpe at 16. The category juice was here right away, but he also hit 209. But also, you talk about we talk about the post-hype season, right? I mean, he was a hot commodity last year at this time. Maybe the price is more reasonable as people have moved on to other names. He just has to get that average boosted. 
Tyro Estrada, number 15 shortstop for me. I wish the park were better. I wish he had maybe a higher ceiling, but he's a decent floor guy. We'll have double-digit home runs and stolen bases. That makes him interesting to me. Nico Horner, defensive whiz for the Cubs. We saw it shortstop before they got Swanson. Last year, he moves to second base. Maybe 10, 12 home runs is probably the cap there, but he might steal 40 bases in a Cubs lineup that I like. I like it more if they can get Cody Bellinger on board. And O'Neill Cruz, a couple of Cruises on our list, and they're both very similar yeah. players. They are enormous uh, their highlights are fa- you know, fabulous i don't know how much contact they're going to make their risk reward picks talk about fomo if you don't have o'neill cruz this year it's a year he busts out you're going to regret not getting him but again a lot of swing and miss in his game uh, the the nl central is going to be really interesting because there's some fun short stops and a couple of them are named cruz and we could talk about them for 45 minutes yeah and we and we'll definitely talk about uh both of those guys uh neither one uh, appear in my 20 to 13 um, so for me, uh, my 20th is Jeremy Pena. Uh, my 19th is Ezekiel Tovar. My 18th is Tyro Estrada. Um, all guys who you had in this range as well. My 17th is Haseon Kim. Um, my 16th shortstop is Anthony Volpe. My 15th shortstop is Trevor Story. My 14th shortstop is Willie Adamas. My 13th shortstop is Xander Bogarts. And my 12th shortstop is is Matt McLean. Um, so let's we'll start with the the one name um, that didn't appear on your list at all, um, and it's Trevor Story. Uh, so I'm curious why you're you're down on Story. Um, for me, I'll tell you on my side of it first, at least. Um, I think obviously the health is is a big thing, and he seems to be fully healthy and ready to go. Um, he was a really good defensive shortstop for the Red Sox in the 43 games he played last year. He is going to be their starting shortstop. Um, there are no real defensive concerns that will move him off of that. Uh, 10 stolen bases in 43 games um, suggest that the speed is still there. This is somebody who had stolen 20 bases um, in the, the last three full seasons before he got hurt um, in 2022. So I expect 20 home runs, or sorry, I expect 20 steals. I don't know that he'll get back to 20 home runs again, but all indications are that he's healthy and had a really good offseason. Um, and so I think that he gets back to being kind of like a 240 type of hitter who could maybe push for a 2020 season, but I think you get maybe 240, 16, 17, 18 home runs, 20 plus steals, hitting probably in the, you know, like in the middle range of that lineup. I mean, he's not going to hit seven, eight, nine for, for that team. Um, and so I think that gives him a decent shot at, you know, 130 runs plus RBIs. Um, and so I, I kind of, I kind of like getting a potential 2020 guy down here. All reasonable points. Since he joined the Red Sox two years ago, and I realize he's been hurt in both seasons, so you have to take this with a grain of salt, but 227, 287, 398 slash. The average doesn't play in fantasy, although if he had enough category juice, we could overlook it. But to have that OBP under 300, to have the slugging under 400 is a major red flag for me. I know statistical comps don't always line up with where a player's career trajectory is headed, but I look at some of the names that, story is tied to now the number one comp is Corey Seager that's good but he's also comp to Carlos Correa who's hit a rough patch we neither one of us listed him and I didn't even think about it uh Javi Baez is the third comp to story statistically a DD Gregorius a player who ran out of gas around this time and he was out of baseball I think uh, he may be kicking around with an invitation somewhere but he's basically out of baseball in his early 30s I'm worried that story is not going to be a player who ages well there's always been a lot of swing and miss in his game Colorado mm-hmm. mitigated some of it, and he's in Fenway Park, so I mean, at least he landed another good offensive park. But when you throw in the batting average risk, when you throw in the health risk, and you throw in the fact that he hasn't even slugged 400 the last two years, I just see more downside than upside here. I, I get, I get, I get it. He could maybe be a 2020 guy if he stays healthy, but uh, my days of drafting Trevor Story with any level of proactivity are are probably over. Fair, I, I understand that. Um, I have him right next to Volpe um, in my rankings. And Volpe is the guy I was alluding to earlier in the mm-hmm. show when I talked about the draft FOMO last year as everybody um, was really big in on Anthony Volpe and, and trying to get as many shares of him as possible. And as you mentioned, there were some real-life issues. I mean, he hit 209 for the Yankees last year, which is not great, but he had 21 home runs and 24 steals. So to me, he and Trevor Story are similar in – 
potential batting average risk, risks, uh, power speed. I, I believe in Volpe's power a little bit more. Um, I, I know that people have this idea that Volpe could emerge as a leadoff hitter for the Yankees. But for me, the the swing and miss has always been a part of his game. I don't think he's he's going to hit for a high enough average that they'll want to hit him leadoff in front of guys like Soto and Judge and you know Stanton or however they they shake that out. Um, so I don't see him hitting leadoff. I think he's probably like an eight nine hitter for them. Um, and I do think that's going to limit the runs and RBIs a little bit. Um, also, like he's a career two sixty two minor league hitter. Um, and usually we see top prospects kind of like tear up the minor leagues. Um, so there were people who were thinking, oh, he'll hit like 260, 270 as a rookie. And it's like, I don't think he's going to hit better in the majors than he ever hit in the minors. Like that to me doesn't really make sense, at least not in the immediate. So will he be better than a 209 hitter? Sure. But I think maybe that's a, that's a 220 hitter. Maybe that's a 230 hitter. Um, so for you the differentiation between Volpe and story is youth health potential upside with Volpe. Is that kind of what I assume? Yeah. The, the trajectory for sure. A, a player in his twenties hasn't had his best season yet versus a player in his thirties who's probably had the best season he's going to have. And also one thing I, I do take hard in with Volpe 8.7% walk rate. He's got any, he, he only, you know, the strike of 27.8%. That's not catastrophic. I don't think this is going to be somebody who hits 209 commonly for his career. I think he's probably going to be like a 245, 250 hitter. And last year he hit the low end of his range. Uh, the bad bit was 259. For a player who runs as well as he does, that's very, very low. I, I think there's. I think he actually could easily hit for something that slots in the median for batting average and you're getting the category juice. Now, I agree with you. I don't think the Yankees are going to bat him lead off, but batting in the bottom half of a New York lineup. This is not the classical New York lineup that maybe we saw 10 or 15 years ago, but it's still a plus lineup. It's a home run park. It's kind of a scoring neutral park. I think people miss that sometimes. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, if you can get Volpe up to 235, 240, which I don't have a problem with, I think everything else kind of falls in line. You're not going to get the volume you want because he'll probably bat seventh or eighth or something like that. But I think everything else checks out. Like, give me the player on the escalator, not in the player on the down escalator. Yeah, I I, I fully agree. Um you know, he had a bigger issue on breaking balls last year, 37% whiff rate on breaking balls, just 22% on fastballs. Um, those are things that can change with with exposure. 74% um, overall contact rate is a little bit concerning to me. Um, I was, so I'm less optimistic than you in terms of the the average bump. But I again, I think he's going to get better as his career goes on. When he becomes a 240 hitter, whether it's this year or the year after, I don't know. But I think it's certainly within his range of outcomes. Um, and 2020 feels feels pretty safe for him. Um, Tyro Estrada is somebody that we both had ranked. And I while, while 2020 um, might not be possible for him, uh, I mean, he seems likely to go at least 15-20. Um, he went you know, 14 homers, 21 steals in 2022, 14 homers, 23 steals last year. And he played 20 fewer games last year um, battling an injury. So he only had 120 games played. Um, so if you're banking on some sort of health or, or more health, I think him getting 15 homers, 20 steals feels really good. Um, there was also um, a, a noticeable decline at least I saw it um, right around the injury. Uh, he stole only one base in all of August. And then as he started feeling healthier at the end of the year, stole four in September. But in the first three months of the year, he stole 18 bases and then he got hurt. So I, I do wonder if like we're down, some of the projections even are downgrading some of the potential speed upside with Estrada because the injury seemed to not just sap the, in, the immediate steals, but also when he was actually back and playing um, it took him a little while to, to kind of get going again. I think Estrada is actually a decent target for value where he's currently going in ADP. Cause it looks like his seasons were pretty similar the last two years, but he played 20 fewer games. As you mentioned, his interest in stealing bases or his willingness to steal bases went down after he returned from the injury. And then he was back to his normal level in September. And I also think because San Francisco, their West coast team, they don't have a lot of buzzy names. I, th I think there's a pedestrian nature to this team that leads to – they're kind of a boring team, right? They play in a pitcher-favoring park. 
and they have a, a lot of just good but not great players. And I think it's just not a, a it's not the buzziness that people want to draft into with the Giants. I think you get like a round or two discount on a lot of these guys. Estrada was never a hot prospect. He kind of came out of nowhere to be a regular for them in 2022. So I think like you're not going to win your league because you take Tyro Estrada, but mm-hmm. he, he has 2020 as a range of outcomes for sure. He would have made it last year if he didn't get hurt. Yeah, I I I keep thinking I, I haven't ranked much higher within my second base rankings. Mm-hmm. He is obviously dual eligible. Um I think that maybe he lacks some of the upside of, of some of the guys we put ahead of him, like an Anthony Volpe or a, a Trevor Story for me. But, you know, if I don't get Volpe and I get Estrada, I'm still very happy. I don't necessarily think that there's a huge difference there. I just don't see as much potential, you know, growth for Estrada as I do for somebody like Volpe. Um, you and I both have Tovar and Pena on this this list. It feels like both of them are kind of safe, like they they tick all of the boxes a little bit, right? I mean, they'll both probably hit, you know, 15 home runs and steal double digit bases and hit for a usable, um, but not extraordinary batting average, something in like the two, 260 ish range. Um, Pena's in a better ballpark, uh, sorry, better in a better lineup. Tovar's in a better ballpark. Um, is there, they kind of feel similar to you in terms of like, I guess they're both also young guys who have the potential to improve, but they just feel like solid, safe, nothing extraordinary, but there's nothing wrong with that kind of assets. Yeah, that's well said. I, I talked about Pena, the, the elite sprint speed, but it hasn't translated to him running a lot. The big story with Tovar to me, one, he's going to strike out a lot. You have to live with that. Mm-hmm. But this is the weakest, Eric. This is the weakest Colorado lineup I can remember. I, mean, I, I think we all like Jones. Um, which I can't believe Charlie Blackman is not only still on this team, but he might hit lead off on opening day, which makes me sad. The Chris Bryant contract looked bad the day it was signed. Um, and talk about statistical comps. Don't look at the comps he's listed to. It will just depress the heck out of you. So Colorado used to be this destination offense for us. Now it's like, yeah, if I don't get Nolan Jones, I, I could live with Tovar as my middle infielder. I wouldn't want him as my fantasy shortstop necessarily, but – you know, Diaz will be a playable catcher, but probably not a lot of upside here. I can't remember ever looking at a Colorado lineup and being just depressed about it. Yes, it is. Uh, it is sad. Um, I'm not going to. There's like there's just nobody. I, we're still going after Charlie Blackman, I guess. Who knows? Um, it, it's it's not something that is really exciting. One thing I, I found interesting about Pena, there's a report that they um, are they changed his stance. He had a lot of preload like movement hand wiggle bat wiggle all that kind of stuff um they're changing his stance however it was noted in the article that mentioned that that this is the same stance that he's had throughout his the entire minor leagues and his first two years in the major leagues um so it's just going to be interesting for me like i normally like the idea of hitters moving to like quieter stances with less going on i think it it helps with their timing um i think it can help them get to the pull side a little more because if there's less movement to get to the ball they can get to the ball quicker but i do get a little bit apprehensive about somebody who's done the same thing for five years changing what they're doing um because even the article said it's something he'll need to continue to adjust to as the year goes on and it's like okay now i gotta see how comfortable he is with that stance because if he is toying with a brand new stance and adjusting to it as the year goes on and trying to not do the things he used to do it, it may take some time for that to lock in um and so it would not surprise me if he came out of the gates slow last season was really fascinating i mean he he improved his walk rate he cut his strikeout rate almost always that leads to an improved season but he also hit a ton of balls on the ground and his home run to fly ball rate went down so that means that explains how he went from 22 home runs to, to 10 home runs even though he played about two additional weeks. I remember, wasn't he the MVP of the World Series? I mean, he was playing so well at the end of his rookie year. I, man, Pena is a hard, a hard call for me because I think his up, I think his upside is he's already hit twenty two home runs in the majors. So you get to figure he can do that again. And I, I know he has the speed to steal twenty bases. And this team generally wants to run. I think even with a new manager, they're going to run. But as you said, there's a lot of moving parts here, and so that's why I ultimately ranked him more reactively than proactively but he's a fascinating player he'll be somebody certainly i end of the year if if we found out he was batting at the top of the lineup or he ended up being one of the 
better ADP beaters on this list that I wouldn't surprise me, but I feel like you can get, if you look at his page long enough, you'll convince yourself of a bunch of things that contradict each other. I already have some shares of him in, in draft and hold formats because of that safety. I just think that I don't see it falling apart for him. Um, there, He doesn't have the upside of some of the top guys who we'll get to now. Um, so will you talk us through your top 12 options at shortstop? Yeah, this is where it gets fun. So uh, number 12 shortstop is Dansby Swanson. It can be risky to invest in a player the first year of the big contract, usually safer in year two. That's where Swanson is. That story also applies to Xander Bogarts, who not surprisingly gets out of Boston, goes to San Diego, starts running aggressively. He's playing second base this year as they're flip-flopping with his teammate. My number 10 shortstop, Hassan Kim. Now, here's the thing with him. The hard hit profile, if you look at that, it will depress you. But he still had a decent amount of home runs. We know he can run. The Padres, very aggressive base stealing team and, and his defense is so good that they actually made that change with him and Bogart. So I, I think Kim will, will settle in nicely at shortstop for them. Ellie De La Cruz, the widest range of outcomes in fantasy baseball. Mm -hmm. He could be a first or second round pick next year. I don't think there's anything of a stretch about that. He could also be in the minor leagues in May, uh, tons of holes in his swing. He's obviously a really big guy at the plate. His strike zone is enormous. He'll swing at just about anything, but when he connects, man, He'll hit at 475 feet. He's a very difficult guy to reconcile. Teammate Matt McLean at number eight. The Reds are so crowded. Why did they sign Candelario? I don't understand it. Maybe it needs an injury to figure out who's going to play and who isn't. Now McLean's a little bit dinged up himself, which adds to the complication. C.J. Abrams, the Nationals haven't done that many things right, but in the Soto trade, they got some good stuff back. They did not do well with the Max Scherzer trade, Trey Turner trade. But Abrams was part of that Soto trade, moved to the top of the lineup in the second half last year, and his pedigree started to put things together. The only reason Corey Seager is number six, because he's dealing with a groin injury we saw in the World Series. Nobody can get this guy out. He's one of the three or four best pure hitters at baseball, but how many games is he going to play? With younger prospects, often the year two is the time to get invested, so I'll probably have more Gunnar Henderson this year, although he's still going to be expensive. Really turned it on the second half of the season. Not sure what's happened to Bo Bichette. He's kind of cratered the last few years or maybe leveled off, I should say. Toronto lineup hasn't been quite as fun as I expected. We thought that ballpark would play offense favorably last year, but it's not what happened. But still, he's, he's too good to get past my number four slot. Francisco Lindor, the Mets, really bad season. But he had a very super quiet 30-30 year. So I think he's a very... You know, low risk place to get category juice to park your money, even if he's not maybe the MVP candidate he's often been made out to be. Trey Turner, number two, signed the big deal. Three year, three months didn't hit at all. He was Trey Turner back in the second half of the year. When he wants a stolen base, he gets it perfect 30 for 30 last year. He was my pick in the labor draft at the 11 slot. I, I think that's a giveaway if you're getting him anywhere outside the top 10 where he belongs. In my mind, Bobby Witt Jr. doesn't know yet. Ball strikes. He's still figuring it out. Obviously, the Royals signed with the big contract. And, and even with that, he's going to be like a 30 60 guy this year. He could do what Acuna did last year with the power and speed. That's in the range of outcomes for Bobby Witt Jr., which is why if you want to draft him, you get to pick second, you get to pick third, or maybe switch mm -hmm. to a salary cap draft. Yeah. Um, my top 12, I have Matt McClain at 12. Similar to you, I had him a little bit higher. Um, I dinged him a little bit for. Um, not just the crowded infield, but also the oblique injury, which to be clear, the Reds beat writers have said his ham, his oblique is fully healed from last year. It is not the same oblique injury. It is not the same re it is not a re aggravation. Um, and it's just, he felt something a little twinge while he was swinging They're They're dialing him back for a week just because it's early in the spring and why, why risk it? Um, but so I don't believe he. this makes him like injury prone. And I think people should be cautious of kind of like making that leap. Um, but it is something to think about is that, you know, obliques are tricky and it can be something that is a, that can reoccur based on the way that you swing in your body type. So the fact that he's played two MLB years and is dealing with oblique issues of different severity is at least just something to, to note. Um, and I do like some of the security of the guys ahead of him, um, like Dansby Swanson, who I have at 11, um, Nico Horner, who I had at 10. Um, I think obviously the stolen base upside there is is huge. I think that Matt McClain does a little bit more across the board, but Horner's speed is um, a real difference maker. Um, I put Ellie De La Cruz nine as well. We'll we'll get more into him. I have O'Neill Cruz. Eight, um, he did make my top ten. Uh, Gunnar Henderson, seven. 
CJ Abrams, six, Corey Seager, five, Bo Bichette, four, Francisco Lindor, three, Trey Turner, two, Bobby Witt Jr., one. Um, so we kind of we have the same uh, top four. Um, let's talk about, let's just talk about Ellie De La Cruz. Let's have the conversation. We'll rip the bandaid. Um, so there was discussion earlier on, uh, before pitchers and catchers reported before spring training started that there was a possibility, or at least was within the range of outcomes that he would start the year in the minor leagues. Now, while some people have gone on to Twitter and suggested that was all just fantasy analysts making it up, it was actually Reds beat writers who said, it's within the range of outcomes, not that it's likely to happen, but that understanding that he has some struggles with with contact and with the contact profile um, and how many people were in the infield, that it was within the range of outcomes. Um, so, you know, it's not fear mongering. It's not um, the idea that like somebody was making up some reason not to draft Ellie De La Cruz. The issue with Ellie De La Cruz for me is even in the second half of the year, so people were talking about how he made adjustments. He hit 191 in the second half of the year. Uh, the power is very clear. The speed is very clear. Um, he also had a 33.7% strikeout rate, and he had a 27% strikeout rate at Triple A. So this isn't a brand new strikeout rate. The interesting thing also, when you look at people's site, oh, his chase rate really dropped in the second half of the year. Yeah, well, his called strike rate went way up and his swing rate went way down. So the reason that his called, the reason that his chase rate improved is because he just stopped swinging. Mm -hmm. So he just kind of took, held the bat on his shoulder. He let more pitches go by. He let a lot of strikes go by. Obviously, he hit 191 in the second half, so it didn't improve his batting average. So for me, it's great to see a young hitter adjust his approach i'm not dinging that at all like i love that he's trying to figure things out but he still hasn't figured it out we need to find the the middle ground between swinging at everything and swinging at nothing because you're not going to get the benefit of his power if he becomes incredibly patient and watches strikes go by and strikes out because he's watching strikes go by so there are there are definitely some issues in terms of the the approach right now and again that's not a knock on him. He's a very young and very talented hitter who needs to find his approach at the major league level. We It will probably happen for him, but we don't know when that will happen. We don't know when he's going to land on the approach that works best for him. If he was going later in drafts, then I would be more than happy to take a gamble on him because his upside is huge. He's going like inside the top two rounds of drafts right now if you're in a 15 team actually in a 12 team league he's going inside the top two rounds too I, I can't pay that price i can't pay it either um when has anybody ever thought about taking somebody in the top two or three rounds where sent down to the minors in may was a reasonable thing to say it's a possibility and as you mentioned you know, he was doing different things last year with the plate discipline and maybe there's a lot of people in his head you get to do this. You're, you're swinging too many bad pitches. Now all of a sudden, you know, he's not swinging at strikes. He should be hammering or at least get, taking a good cut at. They have such a deep roster. They have so many options. They have guys who can play shortstop and third base. I'm just nervous. And he's such a fun player. Sprint speed, 100 percentile. Yeah. We'll never forget the three stolen bases in the same inning against the Brewers. He steals second. He steals third. He steals home. I mean, he's a, one of the signature players that baseball can market. He's going to be a great player. It's just probably not going to be this year. I know it's an eat your broccoli type of suggestion, but I don't think you should draft Ellie De La Cruz where he's going right now. This market has to correct before I'd be interested. Yeah, and and it's it's sad because again, it makes you quote unquote fade a player that I would like to have because I am rooting for him and I think he's really exciting. I just I can't pay that cost. For me, I think O'Neill Cruz is getting lost in the shuffle a little bit, and I actually read again, you know. Our job probably requires us to be on Twitter more than we should or want or want to be on Twitter. But I've read a lot of like, oh, he's injury prone. And it's like, is he injury prone? I mean, his injury last year was also he fractured his ankle while sliding into at a collision at home. Like it, he didn't pull a hamstring. He didn't like, you know, have another real baseball injury where he like had a rotator cuff surgery or whatever. Like it was a freak injury that he is apparently fully healthy from. 
again, the benefit of being 24 years old when you fracture your ankle and not somewhere in your mid thirties, right. Is that he's able to bounce back from that a little bit better than before. Remember that like he was Ellie De La Cruz two years ago. We were talking about, Oh my God, he hits the ball so hard. He's fast. He like everything about his profile is enticing. Um, it between split between triple a and the majors in 2022, he hit, um, 26 home runs with 21 steals. Uh, the exit velocities were off the charts. I don't know why we're just like fully in. And he also was showing improved plate discipline and granted it was nine games last year. So we really don't want to overreact, but he's a young player who we assumed was going to get better. So I don't really know why we've totally forgotten about him. Valid points. I, I still, I, I get worried. I look at that 2022 season. 17 home runs are great. The 35% strikeout rate makes me nervous, but the Pirates aren't going to send him down. He'll probably open the year batting leadoff, so volume could be his friend. And, and much like Ellie De La Cruz, O'Neill Cruz, he's one of those guys that if you went to the ballpark with your grandmother who knows nothing about baseball and said, well, guess who O'Neill Cruz is? You know, Guess who the big prospect or the, be- the expected superstar on the Pirates is? They would point to O'Neill Cruz. He identifies himself because the way he fills up the uniform, he's one of the biggest shortstops in, in major league history and everything he does just breaks stat cast. You know, he, he makes a rifle throw from the hole or he hits a ball with a ridiculous exit velocity. Even though I ranked Ellie higher, I, I can see the case for having O'Neill Cruz higher because the floor is probably better for O'Neill Cruz. And I think the upside is, is probably similar other than, I guess, I guess Ellie De La Cruz has this gear where I can see him running almost every time he gets on base I don't think O'Neill Cruz is going to be that aggressive as a, of a base stealer, although he should steal 20 bases a season. So maybe that's why I have Ellie a little bit higher. But mm-hmm. O'Neill, O'Neill Cruz is a guy you have to have a long – when you rank your shortstops and you come up with your plan, you have to have a long conversation of where do I come down on O'Neill Cruz, especially because he's so reasonably priced at ADP right now. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of excited that he gets lost. I've I've had some shares of him in early drafts, and I think also C.J. Abrams. People see him being drafted early, um, and you know a lot of that is also the 47 steals from last year, right? We're we're paying for those steals because they are, quote, I hate the term league winning, but like that is a, a huge chunk of you know a category upside. It's needle moving there. anyway. We could say yes, that, right? Needle moving for sure. I I read. You know, a lot of pieces are suggesting, like, if you're in a 12-team league, like, trying to get, like, 180 stolen bases is kind of where you're looking at for your team based on how much stolen bases moved. Getting 40 to 50 from one guy is a huge way to get toward toward that total. Um, I also thought that, like, you know, he, Abrams really, again, he is incredibly young. CJ Abrams is just 23 years old. Um, you know, he was called up by the Padres really early and is continuing to make adjustments. I do think that he has the power to, you know, be a 2040 hitter. Um, and, and that's pretty rare. And they moved him to the leadoff spot mm-hmm. um, toward the end of the year. And he hit better in the leadoff spot. He hit 258 in the leadoff spot. Um, the swing in the strikeout rates was a little bit lower. Maybe that had something to do with protection behind him in the lineup. And you know, maybe it was a hot stretch. We don't know. It was only 70 games out of the leadoff spot. Could have to do, happen to do with, with his confidence. And it could have to do with project, uh, protection Sorry, behind him in the lineup. Um, but I think C.J. Abrams belongs up here, um, despite people maybe not being convinced that his name belongs with some of these other guys. Well, I'm, I'm convinced. He's one of my target players. You mentioned those 71 games as a leadoff hitter. 258 average, which we'll take. 48 runs, so you double that in, in a full season, or you, you that's maybe more than double it. He's around 100 runs scored. He hits 11 home runs, 30 RBIs, which was fine, and he steals 34 bases in 36 attempts. Yes, double all those stats in 140-plus games, and, and who knows, maybe he plays a full season. This is a guy who's always had a pedigree, as you mentioned, into an age 23 season, so there's room for growth. I don't even hate the top half of the Washington lineup. It's the bottom half of it that makes you a little bit depressed, but the top half of it doesn't look bad to me. I think CJ Abrams, Abrams is going to be a star and he's still priced affordable. You can still make a profit as current ADP. I want you to put a little star next to his name. Are you, 
are you long term concerned about Corey Seager's groin, or is this like a, you dinged him a little bit because he's not going to start the year on time, but you don't really believe there's injury concern throughout the year? No, it's it's just the career of playing 134 and uh, uh, you know 89 and 110, and I, he's just a guy I never expect full seasons from. Although he's done it mm-hmm. a couple of times, even last year, where. For a long time, we were having fun with the Shohei Otani MVP odds because he was basically he had won the award halfway through the season. It's like, well, who's number two on the MVP list? And for a long time, it was Corey Seager because he was hitting mm-hmm. like 350 at the time. It's like, well, you know, he's already missed like a month of the season. How could he ever win the MVP? And man, he leads the American League in doubles with 119 games played. This is ridiculous. We saw in the playoffs, with the possible exception of Jordan Alvarez, I can't think of anybody who's harder to get out. Freddie Freeman's probably high on that list too. But if I need an at-bat for my life, Corey Seager would be a pretty good guy to stand in there for me. Uh, 327, 390, 623 last year was just ridiculous. But I feel like you have to project him for 130 games. And Mm -hmm. and he's not going to run either, right? I mean, he's shut that part of his game down. And he's a home run hitter, but he's not like a Titanic home run hitter. I mean, you project him for 25 to 30. I know he had 33 last year, but I, I think that's probably the high end of his range. So. I don't like to draft into players who are hurt already. That just makes me nervous. In the case of Seager, he's had so many seasons that had a month of DL time. Mm-hmm. I, I just it, it makes me – I don't know why the Rangers, too. They think they're – they obviously won the World Series last year. They think they're going back to the playoffs. I think they're going to be careful with Seager, probably best for him long term. It may be a little bit frustrating for fantasy players short term. Yeah, this is a down my board, not off my board mm-hmm. type of situation. Um, I'm not – completely removing Corey Seager just because he has been an injured hit player in the past. I think there's always a point where a player with Corey Seager's skills is going to be incredibly valuable to have in your drafts, um, even if you wind up only getting 120 games out of him. Um, So I would not say don't draft Corey Seager. I would say just be cautious of of where you take him. And then also probably don't draft um, other injury prone players on your roster with him, make him the injury you know, the injured guy. So you're you're not, probably I mean, allowed one of those tags because let's yeah. face it, five of the pitchers you draft are going to get hurt anyway. Yes. So you don't want to, if you do have Seager as part of your early build, you need to take that into account when you start filling out the middle of your roster. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, I want to address one guy that you mentioned before, and then we'll uh, we'll get to our sleepers to wrap up the show. Um, but I noticed when I was doing an article on poor plate discipline that Bo Bichette um, has a really bad uh strike zone judgment in terms of swinging outside of the zone. And as I started to dig into it, I realized it's because he can basically hit everything. Um, And so he has such good bat speed and such good plate coverage that he can hit pitches outside of the strike zone and still hit 306 like he did last year. So the vast majority of pitches that Bo Bichette sees are low and away. Um, And pitchers pitch him low and away all the time and he slaps it. He takes it to right field. And that's why his his batting average has continued to go up. His plate coverage is so good. I really do think that's why his power has come down, because if he's going to take low and away pitches and rifle them the opposite way and run a high batting average and, you know, get gap doubles and stuff like that, then it's going to be harder for him to put those out of the the park. That's right. It's harder for him to yank those, but for him, why is he waiting for a pitch to yank? I'm still going to hit three Oh six. So I think you've seen the homers go down because I think, and the, the average has continued to go up because he has that kind of plate coverage. My worry is if he doesn't change his approach, he's still going to be a close to 300 hitter, but I don't know that you're going to see the power go back up towards like 29 home runs because people aren't going to challenge him inside. Um, And then the other concern I have is the stolen bases have dropped precipitously, but the sprint speed has also dropped. His sprint speed went from 28 feet per second to 27.5 feet per second to 27.1 feet per second, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that went from being 163rd in all of baseball to being 338th in all of baseball last year. And his sprint speed was 42nd percentile and ranked 36th amongst amongst all shortstops. Um, So that's not just like he's not stealing bases. That's he looks slower. Now, we don't know why that is. We don't know if it's a he was he added more bulk. Maybe he was playing through an injury. Who knows what it is? That's that's mildly concerning to me. 
Not that it does anything to your ranking of Bo Bichette because he's still a 290 to 300 hitter who's going to hit 20 home runs um, at the top of a decent lineup. I just think maybe you're not getting double digit steals. Um, and so that's the only pushback I have. No, that's a really good breakdown of Bichette. It's interesting that his approach at the plate almost sounds like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And obviously his son plays for the Blue Jays as well. This this legacy roster that Toronto has built. Just a couple of years ago, Bichette was 25 for 26 on stolen bases. And then last year, five out of eight. I mean, he's at the point now where treat this like an SAT question, right? 25 for 26, 13 for 21, five for eight. What's the next column? Yeah. You know, three, three for five. I, maybe he's just done stealing bases. Maybe it, it's always weird for me to spend an early pick on a player where the batting average, we, we like guys who hit for a high average and Boba Shett, maybe win a bang tile someday. That'd be lovely. But you're looking at him. It's like, well, what, what do I feel most confident about with Boba Shett? Well, that he's a 300 hitter that he you know can hit anything. doesn't matter. It's a strike, a ball inside, outside. This guy's going to get his hits. That's just an unsexy way to spend. The power is trending downward. I'm not, petrified about it but i'm a little concerned right. the stolen bases maybe he's just you know okay i'm not going to bother running anymore and that's a concern toronto lineup in general it's, it's kind of interesting how his career trajectory is similar to vladimir guerrero we thought these guys would be superstars and mvp candidates right now and i realized guerrero just a couple of years ago was, was an absolute monster but there's been a leveling off there in toronto and even last year with the park they switched the dimensions we thought it would be an offensive friendly park it didn't play that way this is a, a pick. I don't think I'm going to take Bichette anywhere because I feel like the guys who are ranked around him, I'm more excited to draft. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the stats I'm, I'm seeing him projected for, the stats he put up with last year, I feel like there are guys at tier lower who have a decent chance to be the same type of producers. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, Scott and I are going to give you some names to consider for the end of your drafts um, and some you know potential sleepers. But before we do that, this Saturday, the Premier League is back on NBC and streaming on Peacock. Watch Manchester City continue their hunt for a fourth straight Premier League title when they take on Barnmouth. Coverage starts at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so to wrap this thing up, Scott, anybody that we haven't talked about who you think are names that people should, should pay attention to either as middle infield candidates or as deep league candidates? Yeah, my favorite target outside the top 20 is J.P. Crawford, who's – it's been a slow development curve for him. He's into his age 29 season. He's got an on-base percentage that plays really nicely at the front of the Seattle lineup. He'll hit right in front of Julio Rodriguez, which is the place to be. I think you're going to get maybe 15, 16 home runs, probably 95 runs scored, a handful of stolen bases, not a ton of them, and a plus average. You, you could do a lot worse for your middle infielder. And I, I think he's going to be starting for a lot of mixed league teams this year we, we talked about grissom earlier the red sox bought low on the right guy I, I think eventually he'll percolate towards the top half of this lineup and could be another player who ends up being a double digit double di a double digit homer and speed guy and, and obviously fenway park is a boost for anybody's offensive profile yeah i, I fully agree i like both of those guys uh, and so i'm happy to take them um in most drafts i'm a huge zach netto fan um i've been doing he's come up in so many articles i've been doing in the off season in terms of his quality of contact, um, his plate discipline, he is going to play every day for the Angels. Um, and so I think that there is a lot of category juice there for him, for a young guy who was rushed um, aggressively last year. And I, I think he's going to settle in a little bit more this year. Um, the guys you mentioned. Um, also, um, Geraldo Perdomo, if you're in a really deep league, the Diamondbacks has have said he's their starting shortstop. Um, so I know there was some... Is Jordan Lawler going to take the job? The Diamondbacks have said it's Perdomo. Perdomo still 16 bases last year. Um, he only hit 245, so you're not looking at like a huge um, producer here, but I think there's somebody who could give you speed, um, doesn't strike out a lot, makes a lot of contact, so he will have some hot stretches where he hits you know, 270, 280 over a period of time. And so I think in a deep league, um, that is viable. And then I'm really intrigued by Joey Ortiz, who... Uh, the Orioles traded to the Brewers. We don't know uh, if or where he'll play, um, but Ortiz is a really, really good defensive shortstop. Um, can probably play third if they want to play him there as well. Um, he had really good hard hit rates in the minors, so I don't think he's a zero with the bat. Um, I don't think he is a huge power guy, but we talked about Milwaukee can play up certain levels of, of power. Um, I think it's likely that we see Willie Adamas, who's on an expiring contract, get traded. And I think Ortiz becomes the starting shortstop 
there eventually. Uh, when that happens, who knows? But but he's a guy I'm looking at. And then also, um, I think it's is Daryl Hernias, who is an A's prospect, who I guess is their starting shortstop. Um, and I've heard some prospect guys at least mention that if you're in like draft and hold formats and things like that, um, that he is somebody to keep an eye on um, because of potential plate appearances. And so um, I'm looking into him a little bit more. Yeah, I can see that. You, you need to know every if you play a mixed league, every lineup is important. And I realize in Oakland, you know, you may think, well, okay, I want Zach Geloff and that's it. You know, I, I, I get that. You know, Estuary Ruiz will steal 60 bases and have, you know, five home runs. That's fine. But they still are going to, you know, they, they'll put nine guys in the lineup every day. And they're going to face some bad pitchers sometimes too. So you need to know who's starting for even the worst teams in baseball. I know Oakland's going to win 55 games. I know the ballpark situation is really depressing. But that doesn't mean that some, you know, three or four guys in this lineup will end up being fantasy valuable. And maybe Hernandez is one of them. Right, like Paul DeYoung, starting shortstop for the Chicago White Sox. Um, at some point in time, you're going to think about picking him up off waivers. He's going to hit four and, home runs in a week, and you're going to go, should I? That's that's where we're you at. Met, you mentioned the White Sox. I just did a, a pitching piece for Yahoo, and obviously we, we have the pitching uh, podcast to come later in the spring, but you want pitchers at the AL Central. There are so yeah. many soft landings, and there's really nobody I'm petrified of, right? I mean, the mm-hmm. Twins have a decent lineup. You could squint and see some upside in the Tigers lineup, although there's going to be three or four dead spots. And those are the good teams. You know, the Guardians' offense depresses me, and we'll talk about that on the third base preview. And Chicago, what went wrong? This looked like the the hot up-and-coming team two or three years ago, and it feels like so many of their young players have just totally – I mean, Juan Moncada was supposed to be a star by now. Eli Jimenez was supposed to be winning RBI titles and getting MVP – traction and it just you know dylan cease was supposed to be like a sleeper Cy young award winner it feels like so many and now he's like walking six guys every start it feels like i it's just gotten really sad in chicago it did not pan out um and it's not sad here in our discussion of shortstops um which got uh, really interesting a lot of names hopefully we uncovered for you um, a lot of different paths you could take in your drafts um as a reminder you can follow us both on twitter or x um i am at samsky nyc scott is at scott underscore Pianowski, um, and we'll be back on the next episode where we'll look at third baseman. So we'll see you next time on the Roto World Baseball Show.